Thank you, David. Thank you, SPIE, and you, Marilyn, for the invitation to speak about uh, uh, cerebral blood flow and its auto-regulation. Of course, cerebral blood flow is extremely important for physiology function, navigate disease, uh, healthy aging, and there are mechanisms to regulate that. And this is represented by these uh, uh, curves. So this is a standard auto-regulation curve, which shows that there is a constant blood flow, approximately constant, over the range of mean arterial pressure. And this curve has been used by the Cerebral Autoregulation Research Network, which is a, a, an online resource for anyone interested in this field. But from a research and clinical point of view, maybe dynamic cere cerebral autoregulation is more relevant. This is a study of the response of cerebral blood flow to a transient change in mean arterial pressure. And you see that the autoregulation time scale happens on the order of seconds. This has been studied for many years with uh, uh, ultrasound, with uh, Doppler ultrasound, uh, which can measure blood flow, actually blood flow velocity, in a large blood vessel, typically the middle cerebral artery. And this is a typical result for the response of blood flow to a transient change in mean arterial pressure. The limitation here is that uh, Doppler ultrasound provides a, a unique, a global measurement on the brain, at most with uh, lateral discrimination for the two hemispheres. So this is the neuroscience challenge uh, where optics can help, which is realizing a non-invasive continuous and local assessment of cerebral autoregulation. This is important because it can provide real-time monitoring at the bedside, focal assessment of autoregulation at the microvascular level, which can bring to spatial mapping of cerebral autoregulation, which today is not possible. So in order to do this, optics should be used to measure blood flow. Of course, we have heard yesterday, Turgut Durduran talked at the Hot Topics about diffuse correlation spectroscopy. That's a, a well-validated study, in this case in an animal uh, model, of how the uh, intensity decorrelation times are related to blood flow. Also, near infrared spectroscopy has been used, and in particular, tissue oxygenation and hemoglobin difference. The difference between oxygen and deoxy hemoglobin has been used in the literature as surrogates for blood flow, and there are a number of validation studies for those as well. There are two problems associated with this. While this difference hemoglobin concentration is indeed sensitive to blood flow, it is also sensitive to changes in blood volume and changes in metabolic rate of oxygen. Furthermore, the temporal dynamics, which is important for dynamic autoregulation, the temporal dynamics of this difference in hemoglobin is not identical to the temporal dynamics of the driving cerebral blood flow. So in order to address these issues, we have, uh, my group has recently introduced this new technique of, we call coherent hemodynamic spectroscopy, which is based on a frequency resolver, time resolve study of coherent dynamics of hemoglobin concentrations. I gave a talk yesterday about the definition and the discussion of the meaning of coherent in this respect. But essentially what it means is that these coherent hemoglobin oscillations are characterized by a well-defined amplitude and phase at all frequencies considered. And then in addition, by applying a mathematical model, um, it is possible to achieve three results. First, obtain a measure of autoregulation, a cutoff frequency for autoregulation. Second, correct the difference in hemoglobin concentration for changes in blood volume and for the microvascular blood transit time to generate dynamically, temporally accurate uh, traces of uh, cerebral blood flow. And the third objective is to provide absolute measurement of cerebral blood flow in absolute units of milliliters of blood per 100 grams of tissue per minute. So, I will just illustrate briefly these three points. So the first one is obtain a cutoff frequency of autoregulation. We did recently a study using essentially the same protocol used by ultrasound studies where two uh, pneumatic cuffs were inflated above systolic pressure on the thighs of the subject and then suddenly released. This induces a transient change, a transient decrease in mean arterial pressure, and then we can look at the response of deoxy and deoxy hemoglobin, which are then analyzed with this mathematical model, with this CHS model, to obtain this cutoff frequency of autoregulation, this measure of autoregulation. The measurement was done during normal breathing, normal capnia condition, and during hyperventilation, hypocapnia, where it is well known that autoregulation improves. And we did measurements on 11 subjects, and in all cases, except one, we did find, in fact, that this cutoff frequency of autoregulation obtained with this uh, CHS method increases between uh, 
uh, normal breathing, normal capnia, and hypocapnia during hyperventilation. The second objective was to correct these near first spectroscopy concentrations of hemoglobin, which are, again, considered as a surrogate in the literature for CBF, uh, for changes in blood volume and for the uh, blood propagation time in, uh, in capillaries. So this is the trace we obtained in the same protocol during the transient change in mean arterial pressure. And after we applied the CHS model correction, we obtained this curve, which is shifted to the left to take into account the propagation time in the order of seconds, one or two seconds in the microcirculation. And also on the y-axis, you have now an absolute scale for CBF of milliliters of blood, blood uh, per 100 grams per minute. On the same subjects, simultaneously, and uh, at the same location, we also performed diffuse correlation spectroscopy, and we saw that uh, the temporal dynamic of CBF was indeed consistent with the uh, CHS corrected uh, NEARS. Of course, this measurement with diffuse correlation spectroscopy immediately lends itself to measures of autoregulation, and this has been reported last month by Ashwin, Patrasarati, and, and others. Uh, reporting studies of autoregulation with this protocol and with this fast uh, DCS system. So we are trying to move this application into uh, the clinic and we have performed initial coherent hemodynamic spectroscopy or CHS measurements in the neurocritical care unit in collaboration with Dr. Kornbluth at Tufts Medical Center. And this is a result, an initial result on a 67-year-old patient with intraventricular hemorrhage. Again, the idea is to uh, apply two pneumatic thigh cuffs on the, on the subject and inflate them cyclically in this protocol. Uh, so inflate them and deflate them uh, at the pressure above systolic pressure to induce systemic cyclic oscillations in mean arterial pressure. And then, of course, we look at, at the brain, in this case in the prefrontal cortex, to um, within a first spectroscopy to investigate the dynamics of uh, uh, oxygen, the oxygen hemoglobin concentrations and analyze them with this CHS model. So these are the results we obtained. Uh, the first aspect, the first point of CHS is to obtain a frequency result study of these oscillations. But the first thing, and this is what I discussed in my talk yesterday, is to identify the frequencies where we have coherence. So these have to be coherent hemodynamics. So these are the frequencies identified. And then on the left, there are phase spectra. So these are spectra as a function of frequency of the phase difference of deoxy and oxyhemoglobin oscillations on the top and oxy and total hemoglobin oscillations in the bottom. And on the right, there are amplitude spectra. These are amplitude ratio of D over O, deoxy over oxy, and oxy over total hemoglobin. So this is the first point, to obtain this frequency resolved spectra of amplitude and phase of coherent oscillations. The second point is to uh, apply the mathematical model and perform a fit uh, of this data with the mathematical model where, of course, the uh, fitting parameters are physiological quantities. So that's, that is the fit. And as far as uh, this presentation is concerned, the key parameters of interest are the baseline cerebral blood flow and the autoregulation cutoff frequency. So the baseline CBF was found to be 33 uh, in absolute units, milliliters per 100 grams per minute, and the autoregulation cutoff frequency, this measure of autoregulation was 0.07 hertz. So this 0.07 hertz is a value that falls within the range of normal values that we have found in, uh, in healthy subjects, while the value of 33 uh, milliliter per 100 grams per minute for baseline CBF uh, is somewhat lower than the typical value of 50 or somewhat, somewhat higher for gray matter in normal subjects. But of course, we need to perform uh, um, more, uh, to collect more data here to get a sense of the variability across uh, subjects and across populations. So in summary, I have shown how non-invasive optical tools can meet the challenge of performing real-time spatially resolved assessment of CBF and autoregulation at the microvascular level. And this is extremely important because it has a high potential impact both for research and for clinical studies, for example, to assess moni and monitor in stroke, traumatic brain injury, and the number of neurovascular disorders. So I would really like to thank everyone in my group, uh, starting with Jana Kainestorfer, she was a postdoc in, in my group. She's now a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon. She will have a talk tomorrow 
on uh, uh, topics related to this one. Uh, Kristen and Tao and the two PhD students were directly involved with the study. Angelo Sasseroli, who is my longtime collaborator, and of course the NIH, NSF, and BSF for their support. Thank you.